Good morning. My name is Spencer. I'm one of the pastors here. We are in Exodus chapter 33, verse 17 through 34, verse 9, uh, for the second week in a row. When we originally approached this part of the text, it was supposed to be one sermon, but as we looked more into it, we realized that there's a lot of wonderful truth uh, to sit in, so we're uh, going to look at it for a second week in a row, but from a different angle. Uh, so you can follow along in your blue Bibles, be on page 42, but you also follow along on the screen. If you don't have a Bible at home, you can take that blue Bible. Uh, we want you to have a Bible that you can read at home. That's our gift to you. Uh, if you were to walk by my office uh, in the early morning when I first show up, uh, you would see me uh, staring at the computer screen. And you might be thinking, is he lost? Is he <laughs> dreading the day? What is he doing staring at his computer screen? Uh, I, when I first turn on the computer, uh, there's these pictures, these screensavers that uh, are on the login screen, and there's usually a different picture every time, and, uh, and I'm just, I just behold them, I just stare at them. Uh, they're beautiful. They're different pictures from across the world. They're landscapes, they're cityscapes, they're all types of just beautifully well-done photos, and I just, I will just sometimes stare for a minute or two and just look at the place and look at all the intricacies of the picture and think about uh, where that is. Sometimes they little, put a little blurb up on the top that tells you where it is and uh, imagine what it would like to be there and see that with my own eyes. I just, every morning, it's just like, I mean, they, they got me. Like, I'm just like, before I log in, I'm, I'm just going to sit there and look at some of these pictures. And it's because they're beautiful. And that's what beauty does. Beauty grabs a hold of your gaze. It grabs a hold of your, of your eyes in a way that you want to behold it. You actually want to uh, look more deeply into it. Moses has walked with God in a way that really no one has since Adam and Eve. I mean, he's gotten to have uh, really powerful moments with God. He's gotten to have really intimate moments uh, with God. He's gotten to see aspects of his glory in a way that really no one has since Adam and Eve. And we saw last week this bold request when he says, show me your glory. He wants to behold God in his glory. He wants to see him. He wants to behold him because he's wonderful. He's beautiful. He's awesome. We're going to take a look at a different aspect of that request this week. And then we're going to get to see as Christians why we also should have that same heart that we should want to, desire to, with everything in us, make the chief aim of our life to behold the beauty of God, to behold his face. So let me pray, and then we'll walk through this together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful hymns and songs we just sang, the truth that they highlight, that you are good, that you are wonderful, that you are a, a rock that is secure, that you are worthy of our lives. I pray, God, that you would help us be present this morning, that we would receive with open hearts your word, and that it would shape us and mold us further into your image so that we can worship you, delight in you, and walk this out in repentance and faith. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Pick back up in verse 18. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, this is the Lord talking, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now we spent a lot of our time last week on that aspect that the glory of God is the goodness of God. The glory of God and the goodness of God are two of the same, the same term. They're being used interchangeably. We spend a lot of our time in chapter 34, verses 6 through 8, when God describes himself and the goodness really as an aspect of, if you had two main categories, his fierce love and his fierce justice, that those both make up the goodness of God. And he's telling Moses, I'm going to make my goodness pass before you. And then verse 20 it says, but, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me 
and live. Now, Moses has asked for a wonderful thing, but it's too wonderful even for him. Though he has experienced God in some incredible ways, and though he has displayed faith in ways that if you did a character study of Moses, you'd see so many characteristics of his faith that you would want to mirror him. He is still a sinner. He has murdered. He's quick to anger in the wilderness. Like there's aspects where he's still sinful. And because he's sinful, he cannot be in the presence, the full presence of the glory of God. He cannot. Because if he is, he will be consumed. He will be crushed. He will be killed. And God is making that clear. Now, that is not... That is not God acting like a mob boss saying, if you see my face, I'm going to have to kill you. That's not what's happening. This is more akin to, though not, you know, comparisons with illustrations with God sometimes are uh, fall very short. But it's akin to trying to behold the sun. That if you went outside and tried to behold the sun with your eyes and stare into it, it would go poorly for you. You know, and that's when we did the, the solar eclipse a few years ago. You had those glasses for a reason, right? Because staring at the sun is, is a bad idea. It's, it's too powerful of a force. It will blind you. And it's more akin to beholding the glory of God. It would be like, like being in space, right, where the planet Mercury is and trying to behold the sun and its power there. You would be completely consumed, not just blinded, but burnt up. You and me, because of our sin... And because it's corrupted our very bodies and our nature, we cannot behold the glory of God. It will consume us. We cannot behold his face. It will consume us. We cannot handle the weight of glory. It will collapse upon us. And Moses will collapse under the weight of glory, which is why God tells him, I'm going to show you as much as you can handle without killing you. But you cannot see my face. And then in verse 21, it says, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you, can, where you shall stand on the rock. While my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So he says, you can't see my face. I'm going to allow you to see my back, which is still a glorious and awesome experience, but that won't kill him. So he tells Moses this, and therefore Moses is going to get to experience God in a way that no one has since Adam and Eve. And after hearing that description, after hearing what was written there, some of us may look at this and go, okay, I have questions. <laughs> does, does God have a face? Does he have a back? We saw in Exodus 24 that said he had feet. Does he have hands that he's going to, like, what? It's a little disorienting. It's like, what's actually happening here? Does God have a body? Is a great question that kind of flows out of this text. Is God embodied in the same way that we're embodied? Does he have flesh? Does he have eyes like us, hands like us, a back like us? Is God embodied like us? Or is this what theologians call sometimes accommodation? They'll call this accommodation or condescension is another term that gets used. The idea that an infinite God, who we cannot begin to understand, is accommodating his, himself, his nature, who he is. He's, or he's, he's accommodating himself. He's condescending in a way that we can understand because we are finite beings who cannot understand an infinite God. We, we understand this concept in general, right? Like I have a three-year-old, and she understands differently than my five-year-old and then my, no, six-year-old and then my eight-year-old. And if I talk to my three-year-old, I may say, sweetie, baby, you want to go, want to go play today? You wanna, let's, let's go, want to go out to a, to a lake and, and play? And I would talk to her with that tone and with very simple language because she's three. Now, if Chet Phillips walks up here to do announcements at the very end and to announce that we're, our membership, our church body, our church family is going to Bethel today, which if you didn't know that, you didn't read your emails. And you should have responded by now. It would be weird if you walked up here and said, hey, guys, 
Y'all want to go play today? It's going to be fun. Come on, we'll get you. That, it, first off, it'd be weird because y'all never seen that gear from Chet Phillips. <laughs> Secondly, you would think he's being what? Condescending, which is the popular use of that term. He would, it, that's, that's what, on a much bigger level, that's what God's doing here. He's condescending. He's accommodating. So if the question is, is God embodied like we understand what embodiment means, or is he accommodating himself? Theologians would argue, and I would also, that what God is doing here is accommodation. Now, it's mysterious and widely debated. It's hard to understand. It's hard to wrap our minds around. So there's some things that we do know, and there's some things we leave a little bit to the mystery of God. So here's some of the things we do know. This event in Exodus 23 and 24 is before the incarnation of Christ, the second member of the Trinity. This is before the incarnation of Christ. Christ, which we celebrate at Christmas, incarnates. He becomes human. He does not remove his divinity. He is always fully God. But he takes on humanity. And his humanity, really his his divinity, is actually hidden behind his humanity in a lot of ways. Now that breaks our brain. That's why the incarnation is a mysterious doctrine. But this is before all of that. And before all of that, no member of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God is not embodied. God is not embodied in the way that we think. He doesn't have flesh. He doesn't have a literal face. He doesn't have a literal back. He's not embodied like we are. Jesus, when he's speaking about God the Father in John 4, he says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. They got a spiritual He is not embodied like we are. Colossians uh, highlights that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. God is invisible. He is spiritual. 1 Timothy 1.17, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. You're going to see this theme over and over again, that God is not embodied like we are, that he's spiritual, he's invisible, yet God accommodates himself so that finite human minds can perceive him, can experience him. This is what God does. And when this happens in the Old Testament, when he takes the form of looking like a man, another big phrase that theologians will throw around is, this is anthropomorphism, which I have trouble saying sometimes. It's a miracle that I just said it correctly. But... It's God looking like man. And those moments in the Old Testament, there's another theological word that's thrown around, are called theophanies, God sightings. So there are moments in the Old Testament where there's these God sightings, where God shows up and he looks like man. And even those are widely debated. I mean, from God wrestling with Jacob, which even saying that is a statement on how that passage is meant to be read, to the commander of the Lord's army and the book of Joshua before Jericho. There's these different moments in the Old Testament where God accommodates and looks like man. So I would argue that what's about to happen is God accommodating himself for Moses. God does not have an embodiment like we have. However, there's a lot of mystery still here in even how you read this. Does God have a face in a spiritual sense? Does he have a back in a spiritual sense? Does he, does he have feet in a spiritual sense? Like that's some of the stuff we just actually don't really know. We just, and we leave it up to mystery here. But what's evident from the text is that more of the glory of God, more of his power is bound up in his revealed face. That's different. A lot of mystery here for understanding what's happening here, but It's very clear from the text that however he's being revealed, his face is where so much of the power of his glory is revealed, so much so that it would cause death for sinners. Now, you might ask the question, well, then why the face? Why is God's revealed face so powerful that it brings death? I would would argue that there's something about the nature of the face itself. To know someone is to actually know their face. That you actually can't really know a person until you 
Now, their face, when you try to think about a person, you think of what? Their, their face. It's the reason why, like, in the height of the pandemic, when most everybody was wearing masks, it was hard to actually know people. My children were coming up in school. They were, they were entering school with masks, and it was hard for them to know their classmates, right? Because you, to be able to see someone's face is to really know them. That's why it would be weird if you, were, if you witnessed a crime and they brought you in the police station and they brought in a sketch artist and you sat down with a sketch artist and they said, all right, so tell me what the, uh, this is, I guess this is how they draw. Here we go. Tell me what the back of their head looked like. What was their hairline like? The back of their ears. Tell me about their feet. You'd be like, no, <laughs> weird. This is, you're not real. You're not a real person. You're not a real sketch artist. This is not, no, that's silly. You, no, because you actually need to know someone. It's another face. And I would argue that the face of God is to really, that's, that's where his, so much of his character, his goodness, his power, and his glory is, is bound up in. It's, it's revealed face. So seeing the face of God is seeing his character, his goodness, his glory in an unbelievably powerful way that Moses cannot handle. So God is telling Moses, I'm going to show you as much of me as you can handle without killing you, but you will not see my face. Now, with that in mind, I want you to hear this again, verses 21 through 23, and I want you to see really how unbelievably wonderful this passage is when it says, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And when you understand this, that God is so powerful, he's so mighty, he's so glorious, that if Moses sees him, he's going to die. That's how powerful God is. It's a terrifying, fearful sight. And yet, God is so tender-hearted that he puts his hand over the cleft of the rock where Moses is to protect him because he loves him, because he cares for him. And he's going to reveal at the right time so that Moses can see his back as he passes by. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful sight. It's like a father who has a, has, is holding their, their son and, and they're going through a scary place and a scary scene and he takes his son's head and just buries it in his chest, covering his eyes, walking through the scary scene. It's both God's fearsome, awesome power and his tender care for Moses. It's just a wonderful picture of who our God is. Then he continues, giving more instructions in verse 1 of the next chapter. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite the mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up, Mount, went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded and took in his hand two tablets of stone. Now, I spent a lot more time on that last week, but I'll just say it very quickly, that's good news. What Moses just heard was very good news. The covenant has not been renewed up until this point. When they rejected God for the golden calf, the covenant was shattered and there's been no sign given yet that it's going to be restored until just now. So Moses hears that. Huge relief. Whew. Yes, God is not abandoning us. He's going to be with us. And then we get to verse 5. The Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, Everything that we read at the end of chapter 33 of how God's going to, with deep care and protection, cover up Moses, that's all happening here in verse 5. That God in his glory and his power descends 
right to where Moses is. Moses is hidden in the cleft of the rock. God's hand covers him as his fearsome, powerful glory passes by. So at the right moment, God can open his hand up and let Moses witness his back as he passes by. All of that's happening right here in verse 5. As God proclaims the name of the Lord, which is the name that captures so much of his character, the mystery of his character and who he is, and then God goes on to describe himself in verse 6 through 8, which we spent most of our time in last week. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So this experience of Moses hidden in the cleft of the rock, God's hand covering him. Him hearing the character and the goodness of God so audibly, so powerfully, probably at this point just covering his eyes a little bit. And then God lifts his hand and he, maybe through his fingers, sees the wonderful, glorious back of God. It's an overwhelming experience. So overwhelming that in verse 8 it says, And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped and said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. That he's so overwhelmed by the glory of God that he bows his head at once, falls to his face. He worships. How unworthy Moses must have felt to be able to experience God like this. So unworthy. He's just like, I, if we found favor, God, if I found favor, please, Lord, don't, don't abandon us. We're stiff-necked people. But pardon us. Pardon our sin, our iniquity. Go with us, Lord. You're too wonderful. You're too glorious, God. Please stay with us. Moses experiences the glory of God in a wonderful way way, more wonderful than he could have imagined. And the rest of the Old Testament is going to continue this theme, that the presence of God is an awesome, fearful, wonderful, glorious, terrifying experience for sinners. It is the reason that the prophet Ezekiel, when he catches a glimpse of the glory of God, that he falls on his face. It's the reason that prophets like Isaiah say, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips in an unclean land. This is the appropriate response because sin- sinners cannot stand the presence of God and they cannot behold his face and live. That since the garden, since sin fractured humanity, that we cannot behold the glory of God. We cannot behold his face. And every Israelite and every Jew since Moses understands this. You cannot see God's face and live. And then somebody comes along and starts to teach a new message. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, he says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So this prophet comes along, and he says something that every Jew in the crowd would have just been taken aback by. Blessed are the pure in heart. What? For they shall see God. That's a huge statement. Now, there's some irony in that statement because Jesus is God. But Jesus, his, his divinity is hidden behind his humanity in a way that that they could not experience him. They could not hear the message of the gospel. They could not hear his teachings. They could not see his healings. They couldn't experience the ministry of Christ if he wasn't embodied and hidden by his humanity. And the one moment in his ministry where we catch a, a full glimpse of, not a full glimpse, of, a glimpse of his, of his divinity in a way that 
had not been seen before is at the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus transfigures, when Peter, James, and John are on the mountain and he is shining like light, that's where his divinity, it's almost like the curtain's being pulled back a bit and his divinity shines through in a powerful way. But Jesus preaches this message, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then Christ takes that message and he goes to the cross where his body is broken, where his blood is shed for the sins of man. And then he is buried in an empty tomb where he resurrects, defeating the power of death, and then he ascends to the right hand of God the Father. And that's now where Jesus is. But his message still remains and is with us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That if we want to see God, we must be pure in heart. And when I hear that, there's a part of me that goes, oh, man, that's bad news. Because I'm not pure in heart. My heart is, and when we speak of heart, when the Bible speaks of heart, it's not talking about your literal heart. This is your inner self. But my inner self is stained with sin, selfish motives, all types of rebellious thoughts. It's like, I'm, my heart isn't pure at all. So part of me hears that. I'm just like, I, I'm, then how? How will we see God if the requirement is to be pure in heart? We must take a page from Moses, and we must hide behind the rock that is Christ. That's how. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, that Jesus, the righteous, dies for the unrighteous, which means that his blood is poured out for our sins, and that his perfect righteousness covers our unrighteousness. It is credited to our bankrupted account. So much so that when we believe in Christ and trust in his death and resurrection as our only hope, that God does not look at us and see our impurity. He sees the perfect purity of Christ. He sees his righteousness. That's why in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says, how much more with the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It's through Christ that we're made pure. It's through Christ that we have the opportunity to have pure hearts and behold God. That's what the author of the hymn that we just sang That's what he was getting at in Rock of Ages by connecting Moses and this experience in Exodus 33 and 34 to Christ. When he says, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. That's it. It's doing what Moses did and hiding behind the rock that is Christ as our only hope who shields us from the wrath that we deserve and gives us the perfect righteousness, and covers us with his blood. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Like Moses, hiding behind the hand of God in the rock. Let me hide myself behind the work of Christ. He says, let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. That is how we're made pure. It is through trusting in what Christ has done for us. If we want to, and I implore you, you should want to. If we want to experience God in his glory, if you want to behold the face of God, you need saving faith in Christ. You need to put all of your chips on Christ. You cannot hedge your bets. You cannot find other things in this life as more beautiful, as we say every Sunday, as better than Christ. You you can't put some chips here and some chips there and some chips on church and Jesus. That's not how this works. We go all in on Christ is my only hope. Christ is the one that I want. Christ is the one that I want to behold for eternity. It takes that type of faith in Christ. Now, 
If you have that faith in Christ, the end of the story is wonderful. Because the end of the story for the Christian is beholding the face of God. Because when you get to the final chapter of the Bible in Revelation 22, this is what it says. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. Nothing is staying with sin anymore. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. And then it says, they will see his face. We will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Forever and ever we will behold the face of God. Theologians call that beatific vision, that we with new eyes will behold beauty, the perfection of beauty. We will see him. And the the way that we'll see him is because we'll have newly resurrected bodies. We won't have this this fractured, weak, sinful self that I'll have a newly resurrected body and I will behold our God. That we will behold and that we will see him. That's unbelievably good news. That for then and to eternity, we will see God. Listen, I want... I want you to think about the things that you find most be- that the most beautiful things you've seen in this life. I want you maybe it's a the, the sunset on the open ocean after a storm or maybe it's seeing the Milky Way and the desert sky with your, maybe it's your, your your bride on your wedding day, maybe it's your newborn baby that is smiling at you. Like I want you to think of what you've seen that is most beautiful, the, 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 the photos that you have in your favorite section on your phone that you come back to over and over again. I want you to understand that each of those moments, each of those pictures are a pale, small comparison to the beauty of God. The things that you would long to look at most in this life don't hold a flame to the beauty of our God. He is more wonderful. He is more glorious. He is more beautiful. I love how the late R.C. Sproul says it. He says, when we behold the face of God, all the memories of pain and suffering will vanish. Our souls will be totally healed. Like, I, I, I want that. I mean, just to think of all the pain in this life. Some of you are in really difficult seasons. You're suffering physically. You're suffering the effects of sin. You are struggling financially. Like, this life is just so dang hard. But there's a day coming, an eternity coming, where the face of God and all of his beauty makes all of this moment in life, all of this pain in life, a distant memory where you will be fully and finally healed. That day is coming, which means that the rest of our lives should be anchored, should be centered upon our chief aim of beholding his face. That is the only thing that should matter for us as Christians. That's the only thing that should matter to humanity is to one day behold the perfection of beauty and to behold his face. And the question lingers, does your life reflect that reality? Does your life show that your chief aim is in eternity beholding the face of God? The band's going to come up, and as they come up, I want you to take a moment. Don't shuffle papers. Don't mess with your purse or look at your phone or think about anything else. I want you to just be present right now. And I, I want to ask these three questions. And I want you to consider these three questions before you respond in worship. And as you respond in worship and as you leave today, the first is, is the chief aim of your life to one day behold the face of God? You need to be honest with that question. 
For there may be some of you that have never actually fully put all of your chips on Christ. That you've never actually said, no, that if I'm honest with myself, like I want so many other things, you need to consider that question. Because if your chief aim, if your only hope is not to behold Christ in eternity, to see his face, not only are you going to miss out on something more glorious and more wonderful and more beautiful than anything this life has to offer, that you'll experience the wrath that Moses hid from and the wrath that Christ absorbs for us. I don't want that for you. I want you to look to Christ and his blood, his life, death, and resurrection as your only hope and go all in on that so that you might experience one day the face of God. The second question, what are you beholding in this life as more lovely, more wonderful than Jesus? Now, you may be a Christian, and we're not perfect, and there are times where we wander and we stray, and there are things that take more of our attention and our affection and our desires that if we're honest, we want to behold those things a little more than beholding the face of God, than beholding him. I want you to consider what are the things in your life that you actually, by your life, reveal that your chief aim isn't beholding the face of God. And then lastly, what do you need to lay down before the cross so that your chief aim is beholding Christ? Whatever it is that God is working on your heart right now, that you're thinking about right now, whatever it is that you need to lay down at the cross so that you can behold Jesus for who he is and worship him, which we get a taste of now, but will be more wonderful in eternity. I want you to consider what that is, and I want you to lay it down. And I want you to go to your group, and I want you to confess it, and I want you to actually live your life in a way that seeks the face of God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, help us be a people that repent of the things that we find more beautiful than you so that we can experience your face and your beauty and your glory. Help us be so compelled by that final picture that it shapes the very way that we live in this life right now. God, help us be a people that joyfully worship knowing that your sacrifice on the cross covered our pursuit of other things, but then bring us to you to behold you. God, I pray if there's anyone here that has not gone all in on beholding you, on seeking you, on believing you in you as their only hope, God, convict and soften their heart now and lead them to confess you as Savior and Lord for the first time so that one day might behold you in Jesus' name.